Join Mark Lewis and ROA for an exclusive interview with Ian Anderson from Jethro Toll. Real rock and roll news. From the legends of rock, you found rockonamerica.live. We're bringing rock and roll to America and beyond. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe. Uncover the enigma that is Ian Anderson, the heart and soul of the rock band Jethro Tull. Born in 1947 in Dunfermline, United Kingdom, Anderson's artistic journey is as rich as it is long. He's not simply a musician, but a multi-talented virtuoso, known for his work as a singer, flautist, acoustic guitarist and songwriter. His true brilliance, however, lies in his ability to weave these talents into a singular, unforgettable performance. This is a man whose music transcends time, whose lyrics resonate with generations. His endless creativity has kept Jethro Tull alive and thriving for decades. An MBE recipient, Anderson is more than a musician, he's a living legend. Stay tuned as we delve deeper into the life and work of Ian Anderson with an exclusive interview. Hi, this is Mark Brock of America Magazine, and today I have the extreme pleasure of interviewing a gentleman whose reputation may precede them no, needs no introduction at all. Without further ado, is Ian Anderson, the um, gentleman that is basically considered just for a tall more or less. How are you doing, Ian? I'm very well, thank you. And this is an absolute pleasure. Uh, good. Well, it's an absolute pleasure for me, too. <laughs> I think uh, it's um, one of those days when I uh, should be rehearsing or doing something musically um, um, rewarding, but I'm doing a little press and promo stuff this afternoon, so I'm just nailing some of this so I can finish off my preparation for the tours that start at the end of next week. Not a problem. Do you mind if I go back a little bit with you? Sure. Uh, first of all, what influenced you when you were growing up as a kid musically? Well, probably initially it was American big band jazz. That's what my father uh, listened to when he listened to anything. He had a few records that were kind of wartime era. I'm talking about World War II. Uh, big band jazz, Benny Goodman, Duke Ellington, that kind of stuff. So that, that was the first music I really heard that, that moved me because up until then it had just been church music and maybe some elements of folk music. But uh, big band jazz was the first thing that I suppose appealed because of the rhythmic nature of it and later, a couple of years later when I heard Elvis Presley for the first time, um, I, I heard echoes of, of something that I didn't quite recognize at the time, but it, it turned out to be uh, the blues. So when I was a uh, young teenager, well, 15 I guess, when I first heard Muddy Waters and Howling Wolf and Sonny Boy Williamson and those guys and they first appeared in Europe, um, then that was the um, that was the the catalyst really that that set me um, being involved in music as a player and being uh, being moved emotionally by the uh, by the musical and lyrical content. But even then, as I was hearing it, I knew there was no way I was ever going to be a blues musician because I was the wrong color. I came from the wrong country. I didn't really want to be a you know a third-rate uh, middle-class white boy, um, you know, trying to sing the blues. But nonetheless, I I did it for a little while. I went back in '68 when Jethro Tull began in order to uh, get noticed. But um, it's not that I left the blues behind, but I I felt uh, I felt it was a more honourable thing to keep it amongst the many influences I have, musically speaking, without it uh, um, ruling my, my, my musical output or determining the, uh, the genre in which I would play. I want to ask you a question before I go on the new album, and it, it, we, it, I kind of want to step back to the old album too as we go on the new album, but did, what was the idea for the flute, because that is something completely different for rock and roll, and did you realize that was going to set you so far apart and have such a tremendous impact uh, 40 years later? Well, what I did realize when I picked up the flute was that uh, it was not an instrument that was being played by Eric Clapton, Jimi Hendrix, uh, Jimmy Page, Jeff Beck, or uh, Peter Green. It was um, uh, the, the, the reason that I, on a whim, um, spotted in a music store and then cashed it to my bosom um, was that I was a, I, I'm not a very good guitar player I mean I was an electric guitar player but you know I just knew I was never going to 
reason that I've held over all these years is that I'm the best known flute player in the world of rock music. I'm not the only one, but I'm probably the only one who's taken the flute to that level of, um, of being a, a powerful solo instrument in the, in the rock ensemble. And does that surprise you after all this time? Well, it surprises me in some ways and doesn't in others. I mean, it's not really a terribly suitable instrument to, you know, to uh, stack up alongside the electric guitar or even an electronic keyboard. It's, it's, um, it's not the, it's an acoustic instrument that has a, a delicate role to play in the, in the symphony orchestra, but it's not really an instrument that readily lends itself to being played in, in rock music and, and you know, I, I do it. How successful? I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, I'm the best known flute player, and I'm also the loudest flute player. I want to say this to you. The best of that that I can say is, uh, is uh, I'm certainly not the best flute player. I want to say this to you, Ian. You would not know that by listening to your play. Uh, well, I'm, you know, I, I taught myself to play, so I do what I, I could do, and um, most of the time it's um, it's okay. But I'm well aware of my limitations, and I, I do actually spend quite a bit of time uh, especially in these years I do spend quite a bit of time uh, actually practicing and uh, trying to improve my flute playing technique and I, I've, I've never had a lesson in flute playing but I I do um, I do try um, to improve in, in the ways that I think I can still improve which are primarily to do with the tone and the intonation of the instrument but um, musically speaking, I play what I play. I mean, since I'm the guy who writes the music, I usually, usually write things that I can play, albeit perhaps with difficulty to begin with. But you know, once I get my my um, uh, technique up to, to doing it, then it's it's relatively easy. When I have to play somebody else's music, um, then it's can prove very difficult or even impossible because I'm not a classically trained and uh, adept concert classical musician. Well, what I meant by that was you would never know that the flute didn't take, it didn't have its rightful place next to the electric guitar by the way that you play. No, it's um, it's um, it's it's because I suppose you know again being the um, arranger and composer, you know I try to make sure that I have space to operate and there are places where you know. I'm, uh, I'm not fighting with the electric guitar. Whoever has been the electric guitar player, even in the earliest days when McCabe Abrahams was the guitar player in Jethro Tull, it was, uh, you know, we had a, a respect for each other to, to not not fight each other, but uh, try to give both instruments um, an even footing within the band of solo instruments. And so I think that, that, uh, that's easier to do when, when you're writing your own music and you arrange it and uh, put it together with, those thoughts in mind. Well, I think you do an amazing job with that. I mean, it just sounds very, very natural. And with that, I want to lead in the list. So, what happened to Gerald Bostick? Well, um, that is exactly the premise of the new album, is to look at some of the things that might have happened to the young Gerald Bostock as he grew older. What, what might he be doing in 2012? And that's uh, exploring some of those possibilities as the whole subject of the album. But in using Gerald Bostock as a convenient vehicle to drive us as fast as possible from 1972 into 2012, taking that giant leap of 40 years to, uh, to, to make an album which is really looking at the world we live in today. I'm not looking backwards at 1972, so I'm using the, um, the convenient tool of um, compositional and lyrical content to, to, to bring us into 2012 and look at the world as it is today very different in many cases to the world of 40 years ago, but in, in a few instances, um, perhaps sadly, uh, not so different at all. So why the idea to do this instead of just a different album? Why the idea to go back and do the follow-up? To go back and do what, sir? Do the follow-up to uh, Sick as a Brick and bring Gerald forward. Well, I, I'm not one for nostalgia. I mean, I, I, I'm very happy to use the the uh, traditional tools of the trade, the musical trade, the Fender Jazz bass, the Gibson Les Paul guitar, the Hammond organ, the, you know, the Klangspiel, I mean, things, the instrument, the sonic palette of Thick as a Brick, 1972. I really, really wanted to, to make sure that that was the, the, uh, the fabric of the new record as well. There would be the continuity there. Because 
because we you know, tended from the word go that we would, I would say we, I mean I and my agents intended that this would be played because of Brick 1, because of Brick 2 uh, on tour in 2012. So I wanted to keep the same, uh, the same sound, the same instruments, the same people playing it. And um, so that was, uh, that was a given. You know, I had to work with, with those real instruments. And um, in terms of the uh, few references, there are probably half a dozen references on the new album, musically or lyrically, just just throws us back a little bit and says, oh, remember, remember that, and this is where this came from. But um, it's certainly not going back and trying to, um, you know, write a whole album in the style of the pastiche of 72 uh, retro prog rock. I mean, I'm, I'm aware of the little degree to which I intentionally make those little references, but I certainly wanted to, I mean, they, they were written into the, into the, um, the, the skeletal framework of, of tab two back in February of last year, I, well, January of last year, when I sketched out what I thought the format was going to be, they, I, I, you know, I can remember very deliberately writing in, uh, you know, make a reference to Aquila here, make a reference to this little bit of figures of brick one well, there, and, you know, and, and I, I, I had this idea to, to um, just, just have those little, it's like just putting your hat somewhere, you know, just saying, okay, you know, hello, nice to see you again, but, but just, just, just passing in the street, passing in a crowded street, uh, the nostalgia of going back there and wallowing in some retro kind of mood is absolutely not for me, I'm, I'm, I'm just not made that way. What I do I don't do remember the time when stories. Got you. What surprises you most about how Gerald Bostic has evolved and um, how his whole story has evolved really looking back then where he could have gone? I mean, when you wrote this, did, did anything surprise you? Like, hey, he could become this. Did anything like really surprise you or horrify you about what he could have become? Um, well, I, I started off by writing a, a whole bunch of things down that you know, it might have happened, you know, I had to whittle it down to a manageable few because it was my intention I would kind of buy an album uh, of, you know, from, from this music and so I was pushing it even at 50 minutes, you get going to nearly 54 minutes, it's one of the longest vinyl albums ever to be cut, uh, I know that, we did it a few weeks ago at Abbey Road Studios in London, it's um, sounds great but, you know, really, really is absolutely the limits of what you can squeeze onto a vinyl record. So, um, uh, yes, I was, uh, was um, you know, had a whole list of possible outcomes for the young general Boston, and some of them, you know, the doctor, the dentist, the university professor, the, you know, there were lots of things that I discarded in favor of those that I decided to use. Um, but yes, Gerald Boston could have been an astronaut, he could have been a cosmetic surgeon and a rather smart address in Beverly Hills. It could be all sorts of things, but you know, I had to, I had to, I had to bring it down to a few that were quite different. And, um, so I chose, in terms of a life of corruption, I just felt probably the corrupted TV evangelist slightly edged out the the um, the corrupted um, um, uh, medical man, <laughs> and um, and, uh, and I liked the idea of. Gerald as a as a captain of industry as an investment banker or something of that sort and it seemed at the time that I wrote it it was obviously a very topical subject and and uh, has remained so even now so that one uh, resonates with people um, but I also like the idea that you know people don't all necessarily strive for huge success and I know from some of the classmates I was at school with they just turned out not to be high flyers at all even though they might have appeared quite uh, um, well above average academically but they just ended up living very ordinary lives and quietly they, they set their sights much lower and, and with the intention of having a a cozy comfortable life an enjoyable life with with certain values that um, might seem to those of us like me who instinctively do aim higher and take that's a bigger risk with our careers and our, our uh, life uh, choices. 
people just, you know, I don't, don't build that way. And so I, my favorite Gerald character is really Gerald, a most ordinary man. I just like the idea that, you know, people can turn out that way and be perfectly happy, even though maybe they they harbor secret dreams of, of uh, rather more um, uh, racy forms of uh, existence as, as, uh, as I depict in the final chapter of uh, Tab 2. What was the most challenging part of Tab 2? Uh, the most challenging part was uh, writing and arranging it in a way that was always going to be performed live. And so, you know, it, it, I, I had to really be very, very conscious the whole way through that I was writing music that we could play every note that we played on the record and do it live. And, um, and so you have to be careful not to run away with um, lots of instinctive musical ideas that would just prove to be too complex and too difficult and then sadly because the brick one is full of those moments where it's just you know, there, are, there would have to be six Ian Andersons to do what I did on the record because there are two guitars two voices and two flutes all playing at the same time on some of the sections of music and obviously I can't recreate that exactly on stage I have to make choices what am I going to do um, at this particular moment and for, for that reason I um I knew when we ever came to play because of Brick One live, I would need another man on stage. Well, I'll give the other two or three, but that may do with one, um, who um, basically can take the heat off me in some places to, uh, to concentrate on playing a flute line that is perhaps arguably more important than the vocal line in terms of you know a memorable bit of music. So I've had to. Um, uh, make some compromises there that I really didn't want to make when it came to writing uh, tab two. There I was much more disciplined in making sure it was uh, all was going to be playable. Now I'm going to try to squeeze two more questions in, but okay. we, only, we only might get one because I also want to tell everybody where you can find it too, but when you look back on the, the creation of tab two and you look at the rehearsal for the tour coming up, what is one of the things that makes you really just smile at the end of the day when you look back on everything? Well, I suppose it's that feeling you get even when, you, when you're in rehearsal and you get to the end of either figures of brick one or figures of brick two and you actually hit that last note and you look around at your fellow musicians and you just, <laughs> you know, you, you, uh, you have this feeling of um, uh, team efforts and the, the feeling of, you know, want to go punch the air and say, yeah, we did it, because it's a huge physical and, and uh, mental effort, it's a, an incredible degree of focus that you require to get through it, and, and I guess when we get to that last note, it's, um, it's a really an amazing feeling, and um, you know, you, you feel that, I guess, in most concerts you play, but most concerts you play are made up of a whole bunch of different songs and tunes and ideas that were worried this does feel so much more cohesive. It is um, it is like the end of winning a Formula One Grand Prix race, you know, crossing the line, getting the checkered flag come down and you're the guy who won. It's a, a very, very intense moment of feeling of success. You know? So just getting to that last note without having a train wreck along the way is about the biggest uh, <laughs> the biggest um, bit of fun I've had in a long time. And I know we only got like a minute left, so first of all, where can everybody find you online? Oh, well, that's very easy. You just go to www.jethrotel.com or you can go to www.iananderson.com. Either way, you end up in the same place um, and um, and you get to read everything about the new album as well as tour dates. As, uh, I think more than half of our U.S. tour dates are now listed on there. I know what they all are, but the tickets are not on sale for some of them yet, so uh, we don't put them on the website until the tickets are actually released to sell. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty much all there. Everything you need to know, um, uh -huh. that's what I write it all for, because I'm the guy who writes the stuff that's on the website. It's just one of the things that I do. Are the Facebook and all that, are all those links up there too, and do you do the Twitter thing at all? Uh, well, I do, I do the Gerald Buffs on Facebook and Twitter, but uh, between the record company, my son, and our website guy in America, they, they, they tend to manage the Facebook and Twitter, Jeff Hotel stuff, because I'm, um, I, I actually don't really enjoy Facebook and Twitter. I mean, they are, they are necessary marketing tools in this day and age. I mean, every major corporation has got a Facebook and a Twitter site. But it's not about social networking anymore. It's actually about an extension of your marketing and promotional effort as a, as a corporation. So it's taken on a rather strange tone. And I'm not really, um, I'm not really a Facebook guy. I mean, I prefer to pick up the first talk 
first want to say thank you to Ann Layton for setting this up, and I want to say thank you to you when you're done. Can you hang in one mini microsecond because I want to say thank you again off the record, but sure. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. I mean, this has been a huge pleasure for me. To, I've been looking for this ever since the end set this up. Great. Well, you know, we have some good people around us doing um, everything from booking hotels to doing press and promo and all the folks at EMI Records in, uh, in the UK and in London and in Germany that have been uh, really going behind this project. And it's nice to see, I guess, for them, it's got a little bit more meat in it than uh, perhaps uh, a lot of other things they have to work on. So I guess for them, a little bit more of a challenge, a bit more detail, a bit more... But probably get your teeth into if you're a creatively involved in the music industry and they uh, outside the realms of actually playing a musical instrument, then uh, it's still a creative thing to be involved in, as uh, I'm sure you know, and lots of people like you. So, yeah, I, I think people are, other than me, are having fun with this new project, and that's good for me to see. I, I'm really pleased that they're enjoying doing it. And I'd like, just to close it up, what would you like to say to any of the fans or family or anybody out there? Well, I, I guess I should just apologize that for all those people who uh, might be under the misapprehension that I'm actually making an album for them. Frankly, I'm just doing this for me. I'm just an old guy who wants to have a little fun. So this, this, is, <laughs> this, is, this is my project that makes me happy. And if somebody else enjoys it, then that's great. But that's, uh, that, that, that's, my, that's my raison d'etre. It's, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's about having fun with what I do. And uh, if, I, if I didn't think I was... Uh, going to get pleasure from doing it, it, it uh, all the fans in the world would not persuade me to do something unless my heart, my soul were, were, were truly in it, so um, in a funny kind of a way that also make people feel a little more comfortable that I'm not setting out to impress them or deliver something to them that I think they're going to like, I'm, I'm doing this for me, it's, you know, i got to have fun, I'm 64 years old and uh, if I don't do this now, another few years go past, I'll definitely be, uh, I'll definitely not be up to the, uh, the task, so, um, yeah, I'm having fun while I still can. And Ian, I'm going to say interview over.